Hello everyone again to Subsurface Talks, the podcast where I discuss with uh, interesting guests from CGI industry all kinds of topics related to CG, uh, computer graphics, animation, uh, you name it, but also some kind of life struggles, whatever might uh, affect us as humans, as artists in the modern digital age. And today I have a very special guest, uh, Mr. Jonathan Lax. Animator, director, uh, running a studio uh, in London called Gecko Animation. So, welcome, Jonathan, to the show, and tell us a few words about how you got into 3D and what you do. Thanks, Yaroslav. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Lax. I run Gecko Animation Limited, a company I formed uh, about fifth. Uh, it's about 15 years ago I formed it, but it wasn't really didn't really get going until 2011. So I guess it's been about 12 years. I started in the industry around 2007. Uh, it's when I created the company, but uh, I was working mainly as a, just a freelancer at the time. And uh, I try and do as much as I, much as possible in Blender. Uh, it's not always possible to do absolutely everything in Blender, but uh, it sort of forms the backbone of my production. Uh, and I do visual effects, animation, and a lot of uh, product work, uh, a lot of product um, visualization, I guess you call it. So you mentioned that it's uh, it's been running for 12 years. Like, um, how, how big is the team behind the whole Gecko Animation studio? It's changed. It's changed over the years. Uh, so it started off uh, when things got serious, as it were. Uh, I started with uh, business partner Ben Simmons, who uh, was fairly well known in the Blender community, extremely talented guy. Uh, we were a team and uh, we hired a few other people over the period, um, they're mostly just freelancers who just joined the team. A couple of them came to work uh, in the studio with us for a brief time, but uh, it was mostly just the two of us. And uh, yeah, we got offices in uh, in London, the central London. We were in uh, Broadwick Street in the middle of Soho. So that's just like the epicenter of visual effects and animation in London. It was just amazing to be plugged into that environment. And uh, that was uh, where we started, essentially. And I had a bit of money uh, left over. I've been sort of building up over the years of just working as a freelancer. And uh, so I had a bit of cash to... You know, pay for an office, keep things going for a little while. And uh, so we produced uh, a little animation, like an ident for the company, for Gecko Animation Limited. And uh, it ended up going to the Blender conference in like 2011, I think, or maybe 2012, 2011, uh, where we actually won an award. We won some like best design short or something. Uh, and uh, that we then just basically used that as a catalyst to just email as many production companies, as many um, agencies as we possibly could around London, just say, hey, look at us, we won something, way. And it seemed to work. It, se it seemed to get good responses, and we managed to pick up clients, and a couple of, couple of clients that I still you know, work with uh, you know, recently are still people that I met from those early days, uh, from just putting ourselves out there, just sort of uh, saying, hello, this is what we can do. Um, love to work with you. So uh, yeah, that was um, that was back then. Uh, ben was part of the company for a good while. And then uh, he left uh, 2014 or something like that, I think it was. Uh, and uh, he actually just, just sort of left the industry, really. Uh, he went to uh, produce software for financial services, I think, uh, like banks and stuff like traders software. I honestly don't know for sure. Uh, so I might be completely, um, uh, sort of, that might not be true at all. Uh, but um, yeah, and uh, so since then, I've been mostly on my own, mostly. I've hired a wealth of people uh, for different projects, but none have been permanent. It's all been a uh, per project uh, basis. Um, and I basically just hire uh, people who are much cleverer than me who can do all the stuff that I struggle to do. <laughs> so whenever there's a hole in the production, whether there's something that I need uh, that I that I can't do, uh, then yeah, that's when I get help. And uh, it's always it's, the best projects are when I get to work with cool people. 
you mentioned the clients that you got from this first uh, uh, round of getting your work out and kind of like um, showing off uh, your achievement. And uh, well, I didn't mention that uh, in the introduction, but uh, you have uh, projects in your portfolio for like very, very big names like, like Virgin Galactic. Mm. Uh, so um, I wanted to ask about the thing uh, about showing your work because a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, projects involving this kind of clients uh, like very often demand uh, signing up uh, NDAs and really being kind of like shy about about your work because you, you can't really promote yourself with the work you do. Like yeah. sometimes you can, but a lot of times not. not. So how, how do you handle that? <clears throat> I'd say 80% of my work uh, never gets put on my website. I mean, it's, it's um, uh, I'd love to be able to talk about all the different little projects that I get to get to work on, but quite often it's internal stuff uh, that um, like there was, there, there was a big, like the first kind of big production I did for Virgin Galactic never, ne never got shown uh, outside of Virgin Galactic. They, you know, um, so that was, uh, I was very happy when I did actually get to produce something that could be shown that was actually broadcast. So uh, yeah. So with Will, with Virgin Galactic, yes, I have an NDA uh, agreement with them and it's, um, it is very strict, so I can only really talk about the stuff that is actually out there. So there are two two main projects. Um, uh, both can be seen on on my site. Uh, the first is a um, like an explainer film for one of their live streams that they uh, I think it's still it's still on their YouTube channel. Um, it's a little explainer to show the Virgin Galactic experience, and it uh, takes through all the stages of uh, the flight, uh, how they how they take off, how the, the so if you know how their system works, they have a mothership, and they have a craft that is bolted on to the mothership, and then when it reaches a certain altitude, it can then detach. Uh, the um, the craft that has the passengers on then blasts up, ignites a rocket, goes up, and does its zero gravity thing and then and then glides back down and uh, it's all very spectacular and uh, the the issue is that there's no way to film it the the only way they can film it is have people on the ground with these uh, NASA cameras that have like a thousands and thousand millimeter lenses and they're all computer controlled and they can target something that's that's way too small for the naked eye so when you've got uh this craft that reaches i think the apogee is something like 80 kilometers 85 kilometers above the earth uh that's you can't see that with the naked eye you just can't it's, it would be just e even with the sunlight reflecting off it would just be a dot so you need um uh they, they needed some way to visualize it so uh we did it like a film really like a like a movie production we had uh lots of assets to work with uh we had um uh, the spaceship craft, which we built based off uh, some other assets that we'd made for Virgin Galactic before. Uh, so um, that was actually way back. Uh, like, so I've worked with Virgin Galactic since about 2012, 2013, uh, doing lots of little small bits for them. Uh, and one part involved just creating a 3D version of the craft so that they can see what it looks like and, and design the livery. And uh, that was uh, when we were working as part of um, a partnership with uh, GBH London, which is a design agency in London. They, they're no longer around anymore, but uh, that was how I got involved in the first place. Uh, so we built all of this stuff, uh, had loads of fantastic reference of the landscape uh, they're in the desert. Uh, they're outside a, a town in America called Truth and Consequences. That's the name of the town. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, so that's that's where Spaceport America is located. We just had all of this amazing footage of the landscape. So we were able to create uh, lots of 360 uh, panoramic uh, views just in Photoshop, just essentially just taking lots of shots, filling in the gaps and making these sort of panoramic uh, environments for different altitudes uh, so that we have one at drop altitude and then at apogee and uh, just, you know, trying to bolt everything together and try, trying to get a, 
like a like dealing it dealing with it like you had actually filmed a real craft up there and trying to see if you could get it so that it looked like there was a sister ship flying up with it and uh trying to keep everything grounded in reality in terms of where the cameras could be uh for instance so um yeah that production was was fantastic that was uh orchestrated and sort of directed by mark bonner who was part of the gbh london uh crew uh and uh he's now on his own and uh he and i've worked together on lots and lots of productions over the years and uh he's uh yeah so he sort of directed it and uh orchestrated all of it uh so i really have to hand a lot of the so the the visual and that the energy within the film is is all down to to mark mark's direction so i was more just getting the shots out just doing the effects doing the compositing and getting doing the shading on the craft and getting it all together and uh and then we're working with an editor as well who did the uh, there's lots of graphics on the side uh of the of the frame sort of showing lots of stats uh that's a chap called danny who's a fantastic editor so that was the main team uh just the three of us uh producing that yeah so so uh you got this context uh, also because you've um, you've located your company in the like epicenter of VFX, as you mentioned, like the capital, so to speak, like London seems like a capital city of VFX worldwide. It has been. Uh, it's yeah, it, it, and it, it was really just to. I, I I I think I took this advice from uh, from my dad, who uh, not he's nothing to do with our industry uh, at all, but he he just said, look, you need to plant a flag and say, hey, we exist. Trust us. We have an address. Uh, like in London, uh, perhaps less so now, but it used to be your postcode, like your zip code, your postcode in London was very important. Uh, so if you had a postcode that was like SW1, SW1, uh, and then a couple of other letters, uh, SW1 is, is a very sought after postcode because, uh, it's, it's the West end. It's, it's the uh the creative hub of london is is mostly sw1 then there's wc2 and other postcodes around that are all still very very important to have but if your business has that postcode and it's sort of saying yes we are here it does give you a sense of legitimacy it does allow your uh business to seem like you it can be trusted because they know that you have a premise you have premises you have you, you're paying rent you must be doing something uh, you know, and in the age of the internet, where any, you know anybody can pretend to be anything, it's uh, really important to at least stake your claim and say, "Look, we're for real. Please trust us." Uh, and I think that's still very important when you're starting out. Now that I'm established, uh, and certainly since COVID, where working from home is no longer uh, frowned upon like it used to be, uh, I, I'm not um, worried about being, you know, having premises in london like i used to i think i, I if i was given the choice uh, like i'm certainly looking to build my team again uh, to build up uh, and get uh things uh sort of back to where they were put like pre-covid yeah that, that's what i'm after um very much looking for a producer and other sort of a business partner to work with um at the moment but uh it's definitely not uh, the be all and end all like it used to be the, the part about trust uh, that you mentioned this uh, this brings me to the question i wanted to ask uh, that's regarding blender because we started in the business that's uh, mostly you know, you know basing on other so-called industry standard apps uh, in the in the industry right so so this is probably you know you as a company using blender that's that's uh, at least back in the years it was not the thing that you would show off just to gain trust because it was a lot of absolutely you know, it's it's changing a lot but i wonder how how it played out for you and you know, whether you made comparisons like that or, or considered switching to other software or other pipelines yeah i so i i've i i've honestly i i started using blender 
way back <laughs> when nobody had heard of it. I, I started, uh, it, it, so there was a guy, I've got to give him a shout out because I wish I could locate this chap just to say hi, because he was a school friend from uh, back when I was about 17, 17, 18. Uh, I was um, in Dorset, sort of south southwest England, and uh, he just had Blender on a little floppy disk, little three point five inch floppy disk. It was like one one point two megabytes the the Blender package, and it ran off that disk. Like you didn't have to install anything; you just had it plugged it in. And uh, that was, I think, two thousand and one. I think, uh, and that was when I first saw any 3D software. Like I, I'd heard of Alias Power Animator, which had become Maya quite recently. At that point, at that point, it had been Maya maybe a year or so by then, and uh, I was always excited about that. I bought a Learn Maya book, and you could get like an educational version, uh, and I had that, and I was you know trying to trying to use it and trying to learn it. And then this guy, uh, a guy called John Pritchard. Uh, John Pritchard is a name that's quite common, I guess, in, in the UK. So trying to find him is probably, I, I don't know, I've, I've tried I tried a few years back. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's quite a common name. So it's, it's uh, I would like to, uh, yeah, just in case he's, he's watching, I'd like to say hi. Thanks for introducing me to Blender. Because because Blender was fully self-contained and uh, free to use at the time when I was 17, it was just amazing. And he showed just showed me real basic stuff, how to create a little spaceship, how to animate it, how to make, an, make a few particles. And that was it, I was hooked. Uh, so I did start with Blender way back then, but then immediately I was told, you know, don't use Blender, what are you talking about? Use Maya. So I started learning Maya and I did, uh, for university, I did like a little uh, placement course, and I was taught to learn Maya. Then I was I was animating in Maya. I was uh, I couldn't I couldn't do rigging, but I was um, uh, given rigs to animate. And I, I participated in a couple of commercials uh, doing that. That was all in Maya. And uh, I kind of thought, I, even though I didn't I didn't enjoy using Maya, I was I was I always kept Blender in the background. I was like, I just really like it because every it just seemed every two three months there was some amazing new release in blender and and it always worked that it didn't crash as often as maya and this was maya when when uh autodesk just bought it out or so was just about to buy it out and it, it went through many years of just nothing just really uh very slow development very slow fixes so you'd get a hot fix every six months or something and, and that's death if, if you're if you're a small company and you're, you're you're trying to use a piece of software and the particular bit that you need is broken and you don't have the facilities to uh have like a dev team to to fix it or to bolt something on top that will fix that will like an extra tool or something different that will fit work instead you can't you can't run productions when you're a small outfit and use something like Maya when it was buggy. I think it's you know, obviously much better now. But uh, so I just kept going back to Blender, just kept going back to Blender. And uh, eventually, I, I think I was, I went to the Blender conference uh, a couple of times, like 2013, 25. I think I was, uh, I was invited by Tom Rosendahl uh, in 2013. They were trying to get the Gooseberry project going. Uh, so Ben and I were, uh invited them maybe in 2012 i can't remember uh and uh i was just like look this is happening this software is just blasting it's just going so so fast at the moment and uh so i was like right we just got to keep going and i think that was when uh version 2.5 came out I'm trying to remember i don't know when that was but it was it was when cycles was first introduced uh and it wasn't production ready at all for ages uh, but it's it just like and I felt bad for Ben, Ben Simmons, my my business partner at the time, because he just written a book, uh, a Blender book, that sold fantastically well and was very popular. But it was out of like uh, it was out of date within 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 months because two point five came out and suddenly everybody was using cycles and all of his stuff was all on Blender internal engine before so so i felt bad for that his, his book had a very short uh time in the sun so uh 
yeah, it would have been nice. Uh, maybe if he'd started writing it a year later or something. Anyway, the software updates is like a, a hope of all the users, but the curse of all the tutorial creators or book writers is even worse because <laughs> yeah, because it takes so long. So it takes longer. so long to write a book, uh, and uh, everybody's you know people are really excited for the book, but when it arrives, it's already a little bit out of date. So uh, no matter what it is you're doing, so uh, but yeah, so so going back to your question. Uh, uh, for many years, I wouldn't tell clients that I use Blender. Uh, I would lie. I mean, I mean, I would just say, yes, we're still using Maya. Yep, using Maya because because they understand it and they understand that it's there's a premium to that, that they 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 know what it's capable of. They're like, oh, really, Maya? Yes, you know, this film was made using Maya. This film was made using Maya. These guys must be good. So if you tell them that you use Blender, the first thing that they see is is that it's free, and so they think, well. You know, that's they, they can't be serious if they're using free software. And it's only literally the last four years that uh, Blender is now so ubiquitous and so respected in the industry that it's uh, it doesn't matter. I proudly say that I use Blender. Proudly. It's, uh, it's, it's been uh, the saving grace of the industry, I think. Um, the industry was going down a dark path when... Only one company owns all the software, so uh, it's uh, so. It um, yeah, I guess we are all hoping for that, and I think it's for the better, even for for people using the, um, the commercial software. Um, they they seem to sometimes be annoyed by you know fanboyism in the Blender community, but uh, generally, even the development of of all the commercial software is kind of like sp spurred or sparkled by. by just the competition from Blender. Yeah, yeah, can, yeah. The moment when uh, Cinema 4D, for example, got like a UI change. Like UI was the most criticized part of right. Blender, I guess. But recently, yes. uh, it yes. kind of like mimicked Blender UI in, in the commercial software. So it's right. like something very different. I, d I don't know Cinema 4D at all. So, so that's news to me. Wow, that's fantastic. So for them to update, to try, try and... Uh, uh, conform to to what Blender's doing or what other software is doing. That's fantastic. I wanted to also ask you about one more experience that you uh, had, uh, which uh, I found out when I do when I was doing research about your company and your person, and it is about teaching Blender because you had the opportunity to teach Blender to students, like to to people in a studio, and that was like yes. a big, big studio. Yes, from the store, from right? Store. Yeah, I so I was contacted by Tom Rosendahl, head of the Blender Foundation. Uh, this was uh, 2019 or 2018. He was saying, "Look, uh, Framestore have reached out. They are they have an art department. So the art department is like concept art, separate to production. So they they operate they're in pre production. They they are working with the director uh, and." Um, producers on, on a project to try and visualize the look of the film and to design the sequences uh, way before they film it, way before anything, and uh, to sort of work out the look of the picture. So it's not necessarily part of their pipeline. And it means that their artists can use whatever software they want. They are simply producing animation and images that are just to give you that fantastic feel of the film. And I, I, they the the guys that uh that the, the artists that i was working with they are the, they were responsible for the the blade runner 2049 uh they had just worked on dune uh when when i was there so i heard a little bit about that uh which was super exciting for me uh, and also i mean it shows like the uh production time shows how how long these things take to make but uh this was 2019 and yet they were at that point working on the little mermaid and that film has only just come out so it shows pre-production uh art department uh concept work is uh just happened so early in the in the cycle it's quite staggering uh how early that they were working on all of that so uh yeah, I ended up I went down there for a long time actually. It was it was sort of uh 
few hours a week uh, for a couple of months, really, I think it was about maybe six weeks, just showing them Blender. And it was amazing to see their response. They, uh, so, so these artists, they, they were coming down in their own time, really. They, they were, you know, they, they were coming down to, uh, they, they have a, like an education center within Framestore uh, in London. And they, uh, they were just super excited to see what Blender could do. And they loved how fast it was. They loved how quickly you can just go from sculpting something straight into dealing with dynamics and create some volumetric, you know, thing. And it's just, uh, it, it was really, really great to see their responses. I, I thought that, because these, the, these are some of the best artists in the world. So they're certainly some of the best digital artists in the world. They're, they're, they're phenomenal uh, creators. And uh, so for them to get excited at what, like, what I was doing, which I thought was simple, basic stuff, but they were like, ah, this is fantastic. And I loved it. I, lo I loved the response that I got from them. Uh, I hope that what I did helped. Uh, I don't know. I, I have no idea what was used. Uh, I know that there are a couple of artists that I've kept in touch with uh, definitely have used Blender since then. So that's good. Uh, and yeah, it just to me, it seems to be an extra tool for them. Blender is just one of many different tools that they were using. Uh, I know they, they use a whole whatever they want, really, uh, for that department. As for Blender being used in production, I do not know uh, in Framestore. I've, I don't know if they actually use it at all as part of the pipeline. I wouldn't say that they do, but uh, I don't know, potentially. I've heard like a sentence that, that almost every company has Blender on their computers, but not, yeah. not always is in the official pipeline. Stuff. Exactly. Exactly. It's it, right now. It is still a a backup. It's it's a, a sculptor. It's a UV unwrapper. It's a separate thing uh, that people will just throw like a USD C into it and then back out back into their production pipeline. So, yeah. I, and speaking of like uh, you know, education side of Blender, I initially I think the first class of Blender that I taught was I think. That would have been 2006, I think. I So I uh, I was at university. Uh, I did as like part of an extra credit thing. I joined a friend of mine called Mark. Uh, he got me into doing just an extra bit of teaching outside of the university. So we went to Liverpool, a city in the north, uh, north sort of Midlands or north uh, west of the UK. Uh, Liverpool where these kids uh, from less privileged background uh, were, we're trying to get them interested in higher education and learning Blender was something that just suddenly clicked with a lot of these kids. They were about 14, 15 uh, years old and it was amazing to see uh, these kids. Now this was, you know, this is a long time ago. This is Blender 2. Point, uh, I don't know what would that be, 2.3 something, 2.3. I, I actually, I'm not entirely sure. So yeah, 2006. So uh, whatever version was oh, out at that time. And it, it was, I think it's potential. It didn't even have an undo function for global, global undo. I think it, undo was only in edit mode potentially. So it was a lot of teaching them. Every other click is a save. You just click something, save. Click something, save. You know, try try to get them to do that because that that was what Blender was like back in those days. Uh, it was just um, I might be wrong. The undo function came in around that time. Uh, global undo. So yeah, up until that point, uh, yeah, it was like it was like the Wild West using Blender. You know, you just you didn't know where you would get to because if you did if you didn't save your progress, you were just so you know you're walking on the wild side. So yeah, so I've done that, and I still I still do the odd uh, teaching. Now, like uh, I do, I run workshops at the University of Art in London. I'm like an associate lecturer for them, and it's it's very few sessions. I just uh, whenever they need me, I turn up, and uh, because all students nowadays, if you're learning any sort of visual art, you need to learn 3D in some way, just to just to learn compositing, just to learn, you know, how to how to do some sort of simple basic animation. So they're all, these, they're all learning Blender and it's becoming such a fantastic tool for students just to learn the basic concepts of 3D. So I still do that every now and then. I asked the question about the education also because I'm personally interested in that topic right now working a little bit in the 
in an educational. You're at CG Boost, is that right? Yeah, yeah, CG Boost, and we are trying to help the you know the people in, in the community learn Blender in the most yeah. accessible way. And I was going to ask you uh, whether you find out uh, find learning Blender harder, like teaching Blender harder than learning yourself, or is it a help? Like I heard people <laughs> saying that you know if you want to learn something really well, teach it to others. That's a very good good way of thinking. Yeah, for me, uh, teaching teaching Blender is it, it's it depends on your audience. I mean, it, when I'm in a classroom. Uh, you know, if I'm invited to the university to say, hey, you know, do, do you want to do a couple of sessions uh, during the day? That's great because you immediately see eye to eye with your audience. Now, if you're creating videos online, which I don't I don't do, I don't I don't uh, do sort of tutorials online. Of, uh, I don't know, maybe I should, but uh, it's you don't see your audience. So you don't really know how well people are responding. I guess you get comments and you get feedback in that way. But uh it's really fantastic. It's quite rewarding to see the students light up when you tell them that, you know, Evie just does this and it looks amazing immediately. They go, ah, it's fantastic. Uh, you know, and uh, certainly when you when they're students, you know that they're they're just learning the concepts of it. Uh, the fact that Blender now is very straight in terms of it, the the concepts that you learn in Blender are synonymous with all software now. There's nothing really that's just for Blender. Like it used to be, the Blender U, uh, Blender UI was so unique that uh, if you were to learn Blender, it'd be you'd struggle to learn anything else. You'd have to start over on a lot of other software. But now, if I was to pick up a piece of software I've never used, like Cinema 4D, I've never used. Uh, I'm sure if I did pick it up, just the basic facts that it's it is essentially similar structurally to Blender in terms of how how it works. I imagine. I'd be already halfway there if I needed to. Certainly, certainly if I needed to animate a character, for instance. Rigging is it's like building your own UI within a soft within software. So a rig should it should be software uh, agnostic, software agnostic. Like a rig should just work no matter what it is that you're using. Uh, you shouldn't have to learn another UI on top of a rig, for instance. So. Uh, and Blender's the same, you know, for all of that. So, yeah, it's it's certainly fun teaching people how to use Blender now than it was before uh, the latest UI updates. Uh, so, yeah, it is definitely easier to to teach now than it was to learn uh, initially. The whole sort of left click, right click, select thing, all of that, I'm glad has gone. I, it you know, it. Uh, in fact, every now and then, like it's it's weird. So sometimes I receive a file, let's say an FBX file that uh, latest Blender can't open for some reason, and I know that if I open Blender two point four nine or if I open two point seven two or whatever it is, uh, I know that it's likely Blender will be able to open that file because the FBX in Porter has changed over the years. And uh, whenever I open it, it's just like, oh man, how. How different is it now compared to back then? It's 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 night and day, and I'm so glad that Blender has now made that jump because it, it couldn't have been an easy process uh, producing that new UI uh, and uh, system. So that you know everybody had to start to think differently, which is no small feat. Yeah, I remember the same experience with the uh, DWG. DWF, right? This uh, yes, Autodesk yes. format for, for CAD, because I was like doing a little bit of ArcGIS work, and uh, this was like the standard of getting some files in these formats, like proprietary formats. And Blender, I remember it was like two two forty nine. It was a version that had like an importer that kind of worked, and later on the the other versions didn't work. So, but the advantage of Blender is that you you don't get the updates that you must do. You, you just always have this list of previous versions of Blender, so if something something worked for you in the past, so you can just use the previous version and it, yeah, it can handle this stuff and then you can import it, the file, like open the blend file with a new version, like after the import, for example. So these are things that kind yeah. of already are remedies for, for, for stuff that people struggle with the commercial software. Like if they change something, you're kind of 
right now you're you're even less of an owner of the software with the whole subscriptions models and online yes licenses and stuff, and stuff like that so kind yeah of like, you know, dependent even more for sure for sure uh and it, it, it's it just doesn't make sense when you're a small outfit like like myself where you need to be flexible you need to be able to uh fix things you know like for, for instance uh i've on several occasions not not recently but uh in the past when when you're a member of the blender uh development foundation like when you when you pay a monthly subscription back when that first started i i thought i you know i thought well where's this going to is this going to be helpful to me to pay like there's nothing saying that i should uh but then there was a, an issue with a build of blender where i think it was the camera tracking uh parts of the software that there were some problems there were some issues and i raised it as a bug and uh i think the response was this isn't a bug but it's something that we want to add in the future and i thought ah that's a real shame and so but then i got another message saying hey actually that's a quick fix let's let's give you a separate build now and i think it was within a day i received uh from bartek or some, somebody uh i received a custom build of blender that had the bit that I needed fixed. I was just like, that's, I mean, try doing that with Autodesk, you know, try do, doing that with any other uh, big software because I, I can't afford to have a developer just being paid all the time just to fix problems. So the fact that I'm able to just, you know, be a subscription, to have a subscription uh, and uh, just know that, I mean, less so nowadays, just because uh, the stuff that I'm doing isn't quite as cutting edge now as it was back in the day. Uh, it's um, it's just super handy to know that you can, if everything, if all else fails, you can call on the devs and just say, "Hey, look, if this is, if you do have, you know, sometimes it's just twenty minutes. If you have twenty minutes, just just to fix something, uh, it'd be, you know." A lifesaver so and they're such great guys they're such great the, the whole development team they're fantastic so i remember like being part of a, a community of blender users uh online with the pandemic and like even before uh but what like the first time i was uh, at the blender conference was like last year finally after all these years like i've been using blender for quite a lot of years but you know meeting people on um, face to face was a real uh, real deal right so getting to know you know also people who created the software i say the same applies as you mentioned like teaching uh, students face to face is like a different experience i'm guessing that uh, that also gives a different perspective yeah it's very rewarding and uh, it's only a tiny thing that i do like uh, you know i've probably only done maybe 20 hours a year in, in teaching uh it's just when when they need me on there you know i can i can just uh uh they can schedule it in it's all uh i re i just enjoy it it's just something different to do really uh and um and i've produced a couple of videos for them and it that that was actually but quite recently uh for the university of art london i did a uh that the students were finishing their projects uh they were having trouble with rendering and I have to say the defaults when you open blender if you're if you're on cycles the default number of samples in cycles is 4000 i don't understand why because if you're a newbie and you open if you open blender and you you've got something moderately complex in your scene and you hit render in cycles you're there all day if you're on a little laptop which most of these kids are, they're all on laptops. It's, it's just not going to render. It's, it's, it's there, you know, and, and yes, okay. It has that sort of noise threshold thing, but that's, it's, that's set far too uh, broad uh, a setting. And so I don't know why the defaults are there. So I did a video. It was just 20 minutes long, uh, just going through all render opt optimizations that they can do and just explaining all of EV, how to optimize EV, how to optimize cycles, just how to how to get the most out of your renders. And uh, the responses I got from that were fantastic as well. They, they, they were saying, oh, oh, it was taking half an hour a frame. Now it takes two minutes a frame. I'm like, yes, that's great. That's exactly, you know, because uh, the, the the, the defaults in Blender are still, it's good in the way that, you, you know, it forces you to learn 
how things work. And I love how whenever you if you mouse over any any tool, you get a little tool tip. And that's it's surprising how other software often doesn't do that. Uh, and it's always a really, really useful uh, bit of information that you get on every thing. So I always say that. So I say, look, if you're worried about what, if you don't know what this button does, hover over it and it'll tell you. And it might might be jargon that you don't understand, but Google that jargon and you'll understand, you know. So it's Blender's fantastic to learn for that sense, but uh, some of the defaults don't quite make sense to me. So uh, that would be, that'd be my feedback uh, for that. It's one of these small things that uh, kind of don't get fixed because no one really put this put effort in in that. Like recently, it started like uh, the development of Blender started focusing on these defaults. Like uh, the recent release, the three point six, for example, comes with some uh, presets and uh, they offered like it's not in inside Blender, but with the release, they announced the the release of uh, base meshes. For startups, uh, you know, if you just want to start as something different than just uh, just a basic cube, you can have uh, base meshes for, for like character creation. And I guess they will keep yeah. it uh, separate from from the Blender build because they want to keep Blender as small as possible, right? It's... Well, I, I like like that. There's the add-on uh, that's disabled for new installs of Blender, but it's it's in the add-ons list. Uh, it's like extra mesh stuff uh, or something so that when you're adding, if you just do, you know, shift A or whatever it is to, to add uh, stuff to your scene, there's just a whole wealth of extra uh, defaults that you can use. I, I I understand why that's not by default switched on because a lot of that stuff, even I'm looking at going, okay, I don't quite understand what that is. I don't quite understand. So keeping it simple has its merits, but uh, yeah, that's... I think I would always say to enable that add-on from the get-go because it's it includes so many little extra uh, useful stuff as like basic uh, primitives and etc. I would love to also ask you about um, a little more private question because uh, I know that you are a dad and. Uh, Working in the CG industry is like a really uh, demanding work. Sometimes it's, it, it requires a lot of effort, a lot of hours put into the work, uh, focusing in front of a computer. So um, I wanted to ask you about, about uh, how you manage to balance you know, life with kids and uh, working in CG. Yeah, it's very been very important to me lately. Uh, because I have I have three kids. Uh, one is only five months old, and uh, at the start of our podcast, you may have been able to hear her. She was making a bit of a noise downstairs. She's uh, uh, but to explain, like so, this year has been very difficult because, uh, it, and it's been it's been fantastic in some ways, but very very difficult in others in terms of. I've had lots of work, which is great, but it's, I've also been incredibly busy uh, with family and it's the first time I've been really tested in terms of how much time do you actually have before you go insane uh, to, to, to spend on work? Because uh, even a couple of months ago, like in May, was the first time I turned down a really great job. Uh, I I I just couldn't fist it, and uh, so often I, you know, I obviously will never take a job that I can't complete, and I'm very, very matter of fact on that. But it's usually majority of jobs that you know, I will say, you know, if I am extremely busy, and they need to start right away, I'll say, look, I'll I can be involved, but I can only deliver at this certain point, uh, and I recommend that we have another artist come in. You know, if this is a job that I'm not, you know, delivering the the the, the end product, if I'm just a hired gun, uh, you know, I, I will say the limits. I'll say, look, I'm busy from here to here, but if I do have, you know, a month or two weeks where I'm a little less busy and I'd really like to work with you, but the, you know, these are my limits. But this was the first time that I literally just said, I'm sorry, guys. And it was actually, it was a job, uh, 
linked from a job that I think, uh, from a, a client that I think you introduced me to. It's sort of through, so it was uh, late last year, uh, I, you, you put me in touch with, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, I follow him on Twitter, uh, a, a British blender guy. Uh, uh, Louis, uh, Louis, yes, Louis, right? I think so. Yeah, who, 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 uh, who also couldn't do the work, uh, and forwarded uh, this production company who are in uh, East London, and they they needed to do uh, to build some Formula One assets uh, to create a really cool uh, animation. Where the Formula One cars looked like Skeletric cars. I don't know. Do you have Skeletric back home where you are? It's it's uh, little slot cars. Uh, so they're they're sort of this big, uh, and you have a little gun, little little controller that's just just controls their speed, and they zip around the track. Uh, the track's only you know sort of three or four meters uh, big, and the idea was to create uh, this Formula One version of this slot car race and try to uh, create events that happened during the Formula One season in terms of the eSports Formula One season. Uh, so they needed somebody who could create a bunch of tracks, a bunch of Formula One tracks that made it look like they were made of models, made of uh, plastic models, sort of small scale assets. And that was actually... I think if we talk about sim uh, simulation nodes and geometry nodes, if we talk about that later, I'd like to talk talk to talk about that project, uh, just just in how I spectacularly failed to do it in geometry nodes, and it's 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 something that I would love to have done in geometry nodes, but I ended up doing uh, curves and modifier stacks uh, to create these tracks. So uh, that project went really really well. It was only just over a month, I think, uh, I worked on that. And then, yeah, they, they got back in touch with me uh, last month or two months ago saying, hey, we've got another project. We'd love to work with you. And I was so busy. I couldn't even sort of say, hey, I'd like to help a little bit. I couldn't I couldn't even do that. It was, and it, it just made me just think, OK, look, I've got to slow down. I need to take a bit more time. I need to uh, try and structure my projects so that if a project like that does come along, that I can actually be a part of it because those are the projects that I really like, that I really sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, that I really like doing. And it, it was, uh, I think it was an NPR uh, project, which I don't tend to do that often. Uh, I really like doing NPR render stuff. Uh, I hope all that goes well with them if they're listening. Um, good luck. It's difficult when you know you've got such a, a busy home life with kids to uh, always be locked away doing your work. Uh, it is always very difficult. The situation I have is uh, I work up in the top floor of the house and uh, I always make time to to do the dad stuff. I always so I take I get the kids up in the morning. I take them to school. Uh, I take my while well, my eldest daughter to school. I take my uh, my son to nursery. And the main client that I'm working with at the moment, he understands that I'm not at my desk until about nine o'clock or quarter past nine anyway. So even though uh, sometimes people get started a lot earlier than that, they under they understand that I'm not there yet. And uh, I always try, uh, like today, you know, we, we we had to start this this podcast a little earlier because I do actually have to go out and pick up my kids later on this afternoon. So it's, uh, you know, I like to, I like being there doing the dad stuff. And it's it just means that I have to usually, if I'm busy, I just have to work late. And uh, so it's certainly in May, uh, April and May this year, I think I was working until one o'clock in the morning, most nights, uh, weekends included. And that's tough. That's hard. It just it, especially when, you know, I'm home and I, I like to spend a lot of time with my, my newborn daughter, you know, she's only five months old now. And, uh, you know, when you're not even getting much sleep as well, it's, uh, it is tough. And I, I think, I think I overdid it this, this time. Uh, I don't normally say that. Like I, I feel if you're if you're working a regular nine to five job 
uh, and no matter how much work you put into it, you still get the same amount of pay. There, yes, of course, uh, if you're working, you know, all hours and you're not getting anything else out of it, then sure, don't do that. Don't, you know, really don't do that. But when you're working on uh, projects where the more you work, uh, you know, the more projects you take on, the more you have at the end of the day, you know, the more money that you be receiving, it could get addictive. How do you find it? Uh, like, you know, if, if it, you find that if if you've got tons of work on, it feels great, it feels fantastic, but you soon start to neglect the more important parts of life. So, uh, yeah, I do find it really difficult. But uh, yeah, this year was the first year that I was properly tested and. Uh, I think I learned my limit. Kind of forces you to answer the question, uh, why are you really doing this? And what, yes. what you really want to do? Absolutely. Right? Because you have to be choosing. And it, it, it all depends, obviously, on the type of work that you're doing. Like, uh, so the majority of the work that I was doing in uh, this whole sort of first half of this year has all been, uh, like I do a lot of stuff uh, that working on productions for Carlsberg. And Carlsberg aren't my direct client. I'm through a uh, production company uh, that, um, so they're not they're not my client. But they uh, just all of that work just ramped up massively, and it's it's the sort of bread and butter product visualization stuff. When I say bread and butter, it's it's you know it's it's like regular work that I can rely on. It's just, and it usually doesn't take too much of my time. You know, it's it's stuff that I'm always available for. And it's it's image work that uh, is reusing a lot of previously made assets. So lots of like Carlsberg have so many different brands around the world, and uh, most of it is a bottle, uh, bottle shapes. So you've created, you know, I've created a, a huge library of different assets. And usually it's the case of we need a new bottle with a new label. So I pick the bottle that I've already made that matches the design, fix the labels. And I've got all these photorealistic lighting setups that I use, and uh, that's usually what they want. Uh, and it's just that this year, the volume of that work was considerable. And even though it's it's fine, it's great to have work, it's great to you know be busy, uh, that sort of stuff isn't the most exciting, it isn't the most interesting. And it's not, uh, and it's not anything that I can really show off at the end of the day, because I'm not I don't own that work at the end of the day. I, uh, you know, I, I produce so much stuff for them and it's, you know, I'm not really allowed to show it on my website. It's just uh, because quite often I don't know whether stuff that I'm producing is internal only or whether stuff that will actually end up in the public domain. So I just don't, I just, I just, uh, I, I just don't try and uh, rock the boat. I, I don't, uh, Produce, put any of that stuff on my website uh so it's yeah like 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 you asked an earlier question so much stuff you can't show off and so when a project comes along that you can show off that's the stuff that you really want to put all your heart and soul into because that stuff will come back again and again when people see it uh like there, there's a production that's uh, there, there's an animation i did on my site that i never thought was amazing i didn't think it was that good uh I, I liked it but i didn't think it was you know noteworthy uh this was a uh animation for a restaurant in a set of restaurants in venice uh called quadri uh it's like Qu uh, the quadri cafe quadrino bistro and then grand uh grand marco Quadri or something, which is their their Michelin star uh, restaurant, and that that animation comes back again and again. I had uh, ex execs from Virgin Galactic saying, "That's the thing we love." I'm like, "Really, really? That's the thing you love?" You know? And then I go back and I'm like, "This is such an iconic looking thing uh, that 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 this animation that that." Uh, you know, and I, I can't, you know, claim the whole thing. You know, this it was designed by uh, lots of talented designers at GBH. This was, back, you know, another project that I did with with GBH. Uh, you know, my brother did the sound design on it, which sounds fantastic. Uh, and uh, that was it was a real sort of uh, ensemble production. 
but uh, that's the one that keeps coming back. And uh, so I'm always, if, if there's a new project that I know that I can show off at the end of the day, that's the one I want to focus on. That's the one that I will, you know, put in the extra, the extra 10%, the extra, you know, thousand percent to get that looking amazing. It's, it's uh, funny that you brought up this uh, particular project because I, I was searching through your portfolio that of, of your projects and uh, that really like caught, caught my eye. I, um, I all, even watched the documentary about the restaurant, the renovation. Yes, yes, there's a documentary there. Yeah. yeah, it even had like a star architect designing the interiors there. It's, yes. Uh, Philippe Stark, right? Yeah, so, Philippe Stark. It's one of Philippe Stark's mm -hmm. many, many endeavors. Uh, I met him uh, at a at a like a talk he did uh, that the uh, agency invited me to, and uh, he's a crazy guy. He's at, he's he's like he's like Steve Jobs. He's he's one of these vision people that that I'm sure to work directly with him is very difficult because he's working on another level, and he that it's all about trying to see the world through his eyes to try and get what he's what he what he's doing and uh yeah so so a lot of the design work is obviously straight from him uh and then a lot of other designers uh at gbh and uh i i i'm really interested to see so uh that that, that was I, I hope all my work is still there in the restaurant because i know restaurants change their decor quite quite regularly so i will be interested i haven't been back to venice in a long time so i'd love to see uh what uh, what it looks like now but that as an as an example of a production that required lots of different people uh so i hired my my brother who's a sound designer uh on that production he got just the best response from everybody on on his work there uh and then we also uh hired uh a friend of mine chris lovell who is a digital sculptor so going back to your question about uh the different roles and different people that we work the people that i work with uh whenever there's something sculpting oriented uh like somebody who does zebrush, brush somebody who uses mud box or anything like that those that's something that i don't really do in terms of like i can sculpt you know i can do basic head forms and basic shapes but I can't do that intricate detail. I can't do the, all of those incredible ZBrush stuff. I can't do that. So, so whenever I need some really good sculpting, that's they, these are the people that I hire. I have a few uh, artists that I've hired over the years uh, to be sculptors. So that's definitely something that I'm happy to hire people for that because I think that's such a specific discipline, being a really good sculptor. Uh, like I, I can animate and I think that's another thing that is very specific. Uh, like I am trained in, in uh, sort of 3D animation. So I, I can do all that, but I, it means that I understand how difficult it is to be a really good sculptor. So I don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to ask you about the 3D sculpting because in, the, in your portfolio you um, are um, showing like a project that is a sculpture. It's like a yes. tiny no, printed... I have done. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's another Virgin Galactic thing. Yes, so uh, this was uh, this shows how long some of these projects go on for, but uh, this was back in 2016, I think. I was doing some stuff for Virgin Galactic at the time, but they came and they said, look, do you do 3D printing? And uh, this is one thing that uh, artists and people in our industry come across is when clients don't understand the disciplines that you do. They don't understand how sculpting or creating a model can then be used for animation. They're like, no, no, you just created like a, a simple model that's static and it, you create you did a still image. How can that be animated? Well, actually, it's the same thing. You can just take that model and rig it and animate it. So the uh it's it is always extremely important to try and educate your clients and say look now that we've created something for you you know that we can actually 3d print that really easily uh because it's all the same geometry it's all the same files the fact that blender itself can do so many different things you need to make sure that you're not pigeonholed into doing one tiny little thing so your client might require lots of different skills lots of different bits of a project and they may not understand that you can actually do a lot more uh, than, than they may be initially using you for. 
So uh, that was one thing. They said, do, could you do 3D printing? I was like, yes, absolutely. I can take the spaceship model that we've made. I can take that. I can actually get a 3D print of that in, in metal, you know, using shapeways. Uh, you know, I, I can I can actually export that. It's, you know, it's a very simple process. So uh, they required a uh, set of pilot's wings. So uh, like like the US Air Force or, you know, British Air Force, you know, they, they have these wings and they're usually a lapel pin. You know, it's a little metallic thing that sort of sits in your lapel. Uh, they wanted that for Virgin Galactic passengers or and, and you are called an astronaut when you go up, when you fly up in Virgin Galactic because you reach such an altitude that technically makes you an astronaut. So uh, they they were very keen on making sure that all of their customers, when they have done the experience, that they receive some sort of trinket that they can wear or that they can show that they are part of an exclusive club. Uh, I don't know the, the stats of what, because they're, they're now taking up passengers. Now they're actually, you know, that they've just had their first commercial launch, which is fantastic news. Uh, but they, I don't know whether the, the stuff that I've been doing is still, being used for that. I know that we have produced a ton of them. So I'm hoping that they that all of these uh, passengers are receiving them, because uh, that's exciting. So uh, they started off with a uh, scan of sycamore seeds. And this was, uh, I was working uh, with Mark Bonner, who uh, was my initial uh, lead in to Virgin Galactic. Uh, and we, we went to the Natural History Museum in London. So the Natural History Museum is the largest single building for uh, conservation, archiving, and uh, study of the natural world, essentially, and history of the natural world. And only 20% of that building, I don't know, have you ever been to the Natural History Museum in London? Uh, it's quite an iconic, iconic building. Uh, there's only 20% of the building is actually visible to the public. And it's huge. And the whole back end of that building is all archiving, conservation, uh, uh, categorization, and uh, just uh, and digitization. So they're actually digitally scanning all these samples that they have to get a digital record of all the fossils that they have, all of these, you know, dinosaur bones and everything. Everything's being scanned into a digital record. Uh, and so we use their digital scanning tools, these um, digital scanners that can do like 0 0.1 of a millimeter accuracy in your scan, uh, scanning these tiny, tiny sycamore seeds. And then we use that as a base for these uh, lapel uh, wings. And so my sculpting work was essentially refining those designs and making them so that they would print legibly. So printing, definitely if you're printing in metal, you lose a lot of detail. So I think in Shapeways, Shapeways are fantastic, by the way. Uh, with Shapeways there, metal printing, it sounds good, uh, but the, the, in terms, I mean, it is, it is cutting edge, but it, sound, it sounds like it will produce incredibly high detail. Uh, so they, I think the metallic prints do 0 0.8, millimeters of detail so down to 0 0.8 millimeters and that sounds fantastic but when you take a something as ornately detailed as a sycamore seed you lose so much detail so uh, my job uh, sculpting was essentially taking all of that detail in sycamore seed and amplifying it massively so making it so if you actually saw the 3d model it's so exaggerated all of the veins of the, the the detail in the wings and everything is all just blasted out of proportion because the actual detail on the wings are so slim and so tiny and the the prints just wouldn't pick that up so my job was essentially amplifying all the detail there so it is essentially a a hundred percent digital sculpt like there's very little of the initial scan left it's all just everything's been amped on top of on top on top and uh, accentuated using displacement and like that uh, sculpting on top so that was my sculpture for that and there, there are other areas part of it that uh, like the the seed cases 
uh, seed pods of the wings are they become more defined and they have hard edges. Uh, so though that was that was a design choice uh, to do that, and it, the result is some fantastic uh, wings that are very unique looking. And I was very proud when the astronaut Chris Hadfield uh, held them up on the live stream and said, "You know, this is the significance of." being daring enough to go up that high and trust in the engineering, trust in the, uh, the, the sort of the flight of this incredibly uh, sort of interesting and unique uh, flight design for Virgin Galactic. So yeah, I was very proud of that project. Um, but yeah, as for sculpting, give me some wings and I can do all of that, but uh, give me, you know, the torso of some, uh, Greek god, uh, I will struggle to add all the detail to that. So, so if I if I need somebody to do really good sculpting, then yes, I hire. <laughs> it's really exciting, like hearing about all those projects that you are able to do uh, with the help of Blender, like really getting getting the work from Blender up into the stars, right? Yeah. And I'm looking for people to work with. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that this podcast hopefully gets uh, people to get in touch uh, because I'm looking for business partners. I'm looking for producers. I'm looking for uh, you know, um, sculptors. I'm looking for uh, add-on developers. I'm looking to just to meet as many people as possible so that I can try and build uh, a reliable uh, team uh, to be able to tackle uh, bigger projects. And uh, so that's time, time, you know, COVID's over, time to build stuff up again and uh, get cracking. So, yeah. So maybe direct the people that are watching um, this show where, where they can find your work, where, where they can follow you online on social media. Yeah, you can find me, uh, my website's geckoanimation.com. Best Twitter to follow me on is Laxy, L A X Y. I've fought to keep that name uh i've been offered uh a, quite a few times i've had people offer me money for that twitter name <laughs> and i keep saying no um it's uh yeah I, I i want to move to mastodon i have a i have a mastodon account uh but i i struggle uh i still don't understand how that works in terms of all the different servers and yeah so so much how, different it seems like it's one unified thing, but then I can't seem to connect entirely up to all the people I want to meet anyway. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that there becomes an alternative to Twitter uh, because the Blender community on Twitter is fantastic. Uh, at least it was. It's, uh, it's the most active. I know that there is a good Facebook group and I know that there's, you know, there are good groups all over the place. Like in terms of sharing art, I know Instagram is great for Blender, but uh, in terms of discussion, in terms of finding people and, uh, you know, being, being part of the, part of the great debate about Blender and what's uh, its future is Twitter is where it's at still. I hope that that changes because I'm not happy with the direction that Twitter's going at the moment. Definitely not. So, yeah. Luckily, the Blender community handled before, and I think it will handle yes. the future as well. It will, for sure, for sure. And I hope, uh, yeah, I hope I can come along for the ride on that because, uh, yeah, some, somewhere that's... Uh, as a as a real hub for blender is really important i think certainly for to keep it to keep it current and to keep it to keep the conversation around blender is very important uh, yeah, yeah i'm hoping that this uh, that this episode is also like a part of this uh, sharing these experiences you had uh, and thank you again for uh, taking the time to talk you're welcome you're welcome this has been great and this was great having you on the show I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure being here, and uh, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 not something I've done. I've, I've only done one other podcast before, which was uh, Andrew Price uh, podcast. That was it may have been ten years ago now. Uh, so uh, yeah, really, really happy to uh, be invited uh, on something like this again. So it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Andrew Price, I think he had a small hiatus in terms of podcasting, but recently he got back. 
Oh, has he? Okay, I will tune yeah. in. He started a, started a separate channel for this on YouTube, and yeah, he's doing it pretty regularly. Yeah, and I've, I've listened to your stuff. Your stuff's great. Yeah, it's uh, it's oh, it's thanks. really nice to have real long form conversation. Just uh, I hope we covered everything that you uh, that uh, you wanted to cover. I find that people like working with three uh, D stuff tend to listen to podcasts very uh, very much because uh, like yeah. I, I myself listen to other podcasts. Uh, while I'm working, especially for yeah. like long modeling work or stuff like that, is, that doesn't require you know total silence because yeah. hearing something in the background. I I usually do, uh, except this time of year. This time of year, uh, I'm British and I love tennis and I watch Wimbledon. So Wimbledon has started. I'm actually there. I'm there tomorrow. I'm actually on. Uh, I'm, I'm in the audience tomorrow. So it's my favorite time of year. Is the Wimbledon couple of weeks i really enjoy it so that's that's what would be on if if uh, if i had a screen on uh in the background that was uh, that's what that's what's on uh this time of year <laughs> yeah great so wishing you all the best tennis experiences this this <laughs> <Right>. year <laughs> yeah cheers okay. thanks